Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Valerie Cartwright. I'm a councilwoman here in the town of Brookhaven. I want to welcome you to um, our Deer Forum here this evening. Uh, I am a councilwoman representing the areas of Stony Brook, Setauket, Port Jefferson Station, Terryville, and I have the villages of Oldfield, Beltaire, Poquat, and Port Jeff. I am also the environmental protection liaison here at the town of Brookhaven, and I just want to acknowledge two elected officials that we have here today. We have County Legislator Al Krupski here, if I can just wave. <laughs> and thank you. And also we have Mayor Sandak from Beltaire, please wave. And we have Mary from County Legislator Sarah Anker's office, please wave. It's important that you know where your electeds are, so in the event you have any questions after this, you can reach out to them directly. So over the last few years, I have had an increasing number of residents uh, provide commentary to me in my office about deer in the community and their impacts on the community and the environment, of course. I have also received a number of questions and sometimes concerns regarding what steps, if any, municipalities are taking in Suffolk County related to deer. I have spoken to a number of my colleagues, both at the town level and other levels of government from the villages all the way up to the state. And it's clear that this issue is not unique to Council District 1. Um, this is something that, and it's an issue that's being raised to all different levels of government. So I'm sure that you'll hear today many municipalities have taken uh, steps and some action to address concerns raised by various residents. Some of the municipalities are simply providing information and education to their constituencies related to deer, and others participate in the New York State DEC Deer Management Program and the New York State DEC Deer Management Permit Nuisance Program. The DEC has an available deer management guide which addresses deer management and provides best practices. The first step of that guide is to conduct a survey of community residents. That's what we're doing here today. We're starting that process. This is information gathering, and we hope to hear about the type and severity of deer-related impacts being experienced by community members, locations in the community where problems are most severe, and opinions on whether some community-level action should be taken to reduce these problems. This information gathering will help us to determine what steps, if any, we, as the town of Brookhaven and other legislators within the town of Brookhaven, need to take in the community. We will hear tonight from the DEC who will provide information about deer impacts and then hear from Brookhaven residents and stakeholders about this issue. I'm well aware that there exist differences of opinion on this issue. And I'm also aware that there are varying levels of expertise on wildlife, health, and environment in this room tonight. As such, I'm going to ask that everyone be respectful of each other's opinions this evening, give each other an opportunity to speak, and if you agree, that's great. If you disagree, agree to disagree respectfully. Any participant that is disruptive, argumentative, combative, or otherwise creates a hostile work environment, work environment as an attorney, work environment, hostile environment will be asked to leave. So I just want that to be very clear. This is information gathering. It's helpful to me as an elected official um, to hear um, from my constituency, to hear from other stakeholders, and I think it's very helpful to the DEC as well. The format for this evening will be as follows. After my presentation, um, my speech this morning, this evening, I'm going to turn it over to the DEC. They're going to do a full presentation for you. And after that presentation, we're going to open it up for public comment. As you can see, there's a three there. That means that we will be providing three minutes to each person that would like to comment. Um, if we only have a select number of speakers because we're gathering cards, we may extend that time period to four or five minutes, but I won't know that until we finish the presentation and I can do a calculation of time. I'm not trying to keep you here all evening, um, but I do want to make sure everybody who wants to speak has an opportunity to speak. When you're speaking during public comment, you are doing just that, giving comment. If you have questions that need to be asked, we ask that you fill it out on a card, and we will be taking the card and asking that of the DEC to provide responses. Um, and hopefully, if there needs to be additional clarification as to our formatting, uh, you will have an opportunity 
uh, you know, after the presentation to wave your hand and I'll take that uh, question as it relates to our format. So with that, I want to move this along. Oh, I see Alyssa here from County Legislator Kara Hahn's office. Um, she's here as well, representing uh, Kara Hahn's office. So if there is anything else, uh, Jennifer, that I'm missing? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to now introduce DEC. We have Leslie Lupo, who is the wildlife biologist. Please wave. We have Aphrodite Montalvo, who's the public participation specialist. Please wave. Bill Fonda, who is Mitt, oh, there he goes. He was banning the door, regional public uh, participation specialist, and Michelle Gibbons, Wildlife 2 specialist. So I'm going to turn it over to Aphrodite and then uh, come back up and talk to you a little bit more about the ground rules before we do public comment. If you have not filled out a card, please fill out a card because you will not have an opportunity to speak if you do not fill that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending and also thank uh, 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 Cartwright also for coming out and for hosting us here tonight. Uh, we'll be giving a number of information about deer biology as well as management plans for here. For, I'm going to actually just turn it over to Leslie Lupo uh, and she will begin her presentation. Please keep any questions that you have as the councilwoman stated, uh, to put them on the cards if you have them and also or save them for public comment after the presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening. Again, my name is Leslie Lupo. I'm with the regional headquarters of the DEC here in Stony Brook. And I'm gonna talk to you tonight about uh, a little bit about biology of white-tailed deer, uh, the current management programs and options for uh, landowners, whether that be for um, state-owned lands, municipal town lands, or even your private property, and some community deer management um, options. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of history. When the, when the United States was settled and the pioneers crossed the, crossed the land, um, a lot of wildlife was decimated. All the forests were pretty much removed so that people could build their homesteads and farms. Um, so much by the end of the 1800s, uh, the deer population was very low and non-existent in some places. So by the early 1900s, states started to enact uh, protections and in some places closed or limited the harvest of deer. So fast forward. Um, Deer have evolved as a prey species, and they produce rather quickly. In most cases, they're going to have two fawns per year. Um, they're polygamous, so males and females are not picky. <laughs> and they have a high biotic potential. So no management means more and more deer. There are very limited in the amount of predators that we have here. So like I said, they've evolved as a prey species. Um, if we had the regular host of predators, we'd have mountain lions, wolves, uh, potentially bobcats, coyotes, all these things helping to reduce the population, black bear. But those things have done, since been or never occurred here. So nothing's really been checking this population other than um, human hunter harvest and potentially our car vehicle strikes. So as the councilwoman mentioned, they are a threat to biodiversity. Um, they are impacting our forests. They eat the saplings before they reach maturity. Um, this also Im impacts biodiversity. So the ground nesting birds or songbirds that utilize those spaces don't have places to have safe nesting and reproduce themselves. So they are a huge um, changer of their own habitat. We also look at the impacts of um, our economic impacts, and those are in the form of deer car accidents causing thousands of dollars in, in vehicle repairs or total vehicles. <clears throat> as far as um, agriculture is concerned, a lot of our farms um, experience increased damage even in our homes now, the deer are eating our landscape plantings and, and bringing um, ticks closer and closer to our homes. So those are all impacts that 
are not just, uh, people would think that this was uh, an issue for farmers, but it's not just an issue for farmers anymore. It's, it's a residential urban suburban problem as well. So most people think of, well, wildlife, they kind of control themselves, right? You know, they're gonna eat whatever is out on the landscape and then there won't be any more food and it's self-controlled. Well, this isn't necessarily true in this case. So say if we're in the Adirondacks and the deer strictly just lived in the forest, yes, they would eat such and such amount of vegetation, the vegetation would be gone and there would be no more food. And then the, the population would be limited in that way. But in our landscape in Suffolk County, we have a mix. We have urban suburban area, we have um, forest and farm. So the carrying capacity is not checked. Deer will just eat a bit here and then move on to the next property, or eat your hostas and eat your azaleas and move on to your garden and then go into the woodland at night for cover and then go into the farm next door. So there really is no check as far as resources on the deer. So there, unless we're removing them, there is no limiting car carrying capacity. So some of the management tools, um, both lethal and non-lethal. Lethal, lethal we, we look at recreational hunting. There can be more organized hunts, and we have a deer damage permit program where if you're experiencing uh, damage to your property, you can apply, and if the uh, case warrants it and it's legal to do so, then we will we'll issue a permit so that you can remove deer on your own property. And then non-lethal non um, tools are fencing, scare devices, capture, relocation, and I will get a little bit more into these. So again, recreational hunting is really our most utilized tool throughout the whole state, not just here in Suffolk County. Uh, it's a long-standing tra tradition. It's safe and effective. We have a huge bow hunting culture here on Long Island, which is uh, very safe. We have no, no records of any major incidents other than people getting injured on their own equipment. Um, and it's really the only free management tool. And in that I mean that someone else isn't paying, the hunters pay, but the property owner is not paying. So we published our deer management plan in 2012. And in that we indicated some impediments to management on here on Long Island. So one of the major ones is access. There are so many lands that are not accessible to hunters. Certainly we have um, state lands, and when I, when I say state lands, I mean DEC lands, in which we allow hunters on. But not all entities of the state or the county or in municipal lands uh, allow hunter access. Um, back in 2012 when we wrote this, the setback for archery hunting was 500 feet from an occupied dwelling, and we had a whole bunch of uh, extra procedures through our January shotgun season, so we required town permits, there was no, no archery season concurrent to the firearm season, you couldn't hunt on the weekends, there was a 10 acre um, requirement for a possible for, for firearm hunting. And again, we have no hunting season in Nassau County, so that problem builds there as well. So with that, um, in 2014, we had some of these were able to be changed for the better. The 500 foot setback for archery hunting changed down to 150 feet from a dwelling. And some of the requirements for the January shotgun uh, season changed as well. So like I said, we have seasons that are, are managed for deer here on, on Long Island and throughout the state. Our archery season is October 1 through January 1 now, and all of Suffolk County is open. Um, our archery season is only with vertical bows. The discharge setback is 150 feet, and there is no requirement for a town, or, town permit or a landowner endorsement. And then our shotgun season is the first Sunday in January through the entire month, and this includes weekends now. All of Suffolk County is open. Um, and then the, the law was written such that some towns can opt out of having a town permit. So currently, most of the East End towns have opted out with still Southampton requiring a town permit. 
And then our legal structure for tags pr pretty much allows for unlimited harvest of, of antlerless deer here. So as you can see, um, over time, the, the harvest has been increasing and increasing to go along with our increased population. Um, and then I'll just say that the years um, after 2013, that the, the harvest has still continued to increase about roughly about 32 to 3,400 within the last five years. So like I mentioned that some uh, municipalities can help their, their citizens by um, organizing hunts in their area. Uh, this can help belay some fears in, in this way and connect landowners with hunters. The municipality can uh, ask a hunter for a proficiency test, um, do background checks, and can also um, administer it additional training in order to make the residents feel more comfortable. This is not necessary, but it, it sometimes it helps um, landowners to feel more comfortable having hunters on their property. So like I said, I also issue damage permits for outside of the hunting season, and this is property specific. Uh, they're issued in the cases where damage is occurring or likely to occur. And we issue these permits generally for antlerless deer, and that is because we would like to gauge um, removal on the female level. Females um, will, are the breeders, right? No matter how many males are out on the landscape, they're gonna continue to breed. So it's more effective to remove females off of the landscape. And again, like I said, these permits are generally issued outside of the hunting season, and these are by licensed hunters. Calling is also just targeted removement with a permit, and you could utilize um, either different companies. There are nuisance wildlife control operator companies now, or USA Wildlife Services. So this can be effective uh, in that you may have people that are more trained, or you may feel that they're more trained, um, but this can come with some cost to it. But there are, there are nuisance wildlife con control operators that will do this for a volunteer to be free as well. So something we've been looking at, um, especially in suburban urban areas, is capture and euthanize. Um, this definitely comes with um, extra considerations. Um, that you would think that you're, this would be more in places where you can't discharge a firearm. So to trap and then put the animal down with a captive bolt which renders the deer unconscious. Um, but this does, it is complicated in that the, the person doing this would also have to have drugs on hands, and that means they would have to have a drug license to then put the deer down in the event that the captive vault didn't, didn't work properly. So I'm gonna move on to some non-lethal alternatives. This could be fencing. And there's a multitude of types of fencing, whether it be chain link, plastic, woven wire, and electric. Um, in, in any case, the fence needs to be at least eight feet tall. Deer are really great jumpers. Um, and fences, although they might solve your problem protecting your property, it does push the deer out, either out into the roads and onto your neighbor's property. So it's, it's, it's not a cure-all. There are some scare tactics, that, scare tactics that work on limited basis. There's um, deterrence in, in repellents. These things need to be um, an approved pesticide, but they also come off with any, any rain or humidity and have to be reapplied frequently. <clears throat> some noise makers can provides some short-term benefit, um, but often there's either noise ordinance specifically in a suburban town, and then the deer often are, uh, they get accustomed to it and they'll just come back. So people, people often ask, well, why can't you just take them where they belong or take them out of here? They don't, they don't belong in suburbia. So, well, they do really well in suburbia. It's not that they don't belong. We're just not used to it. Um, but we don't, we don't authorize capture and relocation because it doesn't work. 
either the animals um, suffer from capture myopathy, that means they uh, pretty much die so shortly after release. We, we don't move wildlife in general as a, as a practice because we don't want to spread disease. You could potentially take a, a deer or an animal that had disease and bring it to a potentially clear area and then infect the local population. And pretty much the whole eastern seaboard is suffering of some sort of deer overabundance, so there's really no place to bring them. And in the end, it's expensive. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some uh, fertility control options. First being surgical sterilization. Surgical sterilization when is, is when you actually put, have the deer um, have a surgery. Um, and there's different types. There's tubal ligation, ovarectomy. Tubal ligation is essentially cutting the tubes. Um, but we know this doesn't work in that the deer will still signal that they're willing to mate. And in some cases, it's, it's shown scientifically that more males immigrate into an area where a deer have had tubal ligation. Uh, otherwise, there's ovarectomy, which it can work. However, it's incredibly expensive, so you have to bring in vets, uh, sedate the deer, and remove the ovaries. So um, in cases where it has been used, it, sure, the deer are not necessarily reproducing anymore, but you're not removing deer off the landscape. Again, it's expensive. And the local project that we did have in East Hampton fell apart after two years from uh, negative constituent um, issues. <clears throat> Another method of fertility control is chemical contraception. So there's research going on, um, mostly with the drug PZP, porcine zona paluta. So it is a protein that pretty much blocks fertilization of the egg, um, which also comes with its own issues. These, it doesn't remove deer off the landscape. This is a research, thank you. These are only conducted via research. So we, the research that has been conducted thus far, um, we haven't learned that Deer can be treated on the broad landscape in the few places that it has been used in a very small area, fenced in area, or a small island. There may be some benefit to this, but it's not practical on an open landscape, such as a, a town like Brookhaven. The other considerations is that pretty much 90% 90, 90 of the females have to be treated, and with these drugs, they have to be treated multiple times. So um, research is still ongoing. Maybe it will prove to be something beneficial in the future, but currently is, is not an answer to, to this over deer overabundance problem. <clears throat> so in any non-lethal management program, we would also like to see some sort of lethal management. Again, like I said, there, the non-lethal management, there is, there is no deer being removed off the landscape. So um, if you're identifying problems, those problems are not going to go away. So again, I, I addressed that access is, a, is an issue on publicly owned lands, <clears throat> such as DEC, DEC lands. Um, anything that is suitable for hunting, DEC has opened it. In some of Suffolk County, State Parks is, is open to hunting. Um, some of the parcels that are here in Brookhaven, Brookhaven State Park and Wildwood State Park have been open to archery hunting in the last several years. Um, <clears throat> the county has a robust archery hunting program and they continue to add properties every year. And the town um, does have a few adjacent properties to DEC land that we manage cooperatively with the town. So, but that being said, a lot of the lands are held in, in private ownership. So this is an integral part in deer management. Unmanaged lands are refuges for deer where they continue to um, reproduce. So with the, with the change of the setback laws, 
many more lands could be opened and are, should be available to hunting. <clears throat> but this, this requires community support. So DEC has published this very nice guide that um, Councilwoman had mentioned, the Community Deer Management Guide. It has a host of uh, information, a lot of what I discussed already, some other links to beneficial information. Um, where people can get started in discussing surveys or what are, what are your impacts or how do we even talk about this. So this is located on our website, but it, it is a, a very good tool. So in community-based steer management, what we're doing here today is we're recognizing there, there's a problem. What people have to do is get together and define what, what their objectives are. Do, do we want to reduce car strikes? Do we want to reduce incidents of tick-borne illness? Uh, do I just don't want anyone to eat my tomatoes? <clears throat> and then the community needs to get together and decide what, what is acceptable. Or maybe you meet, need to break it down into small areas. This is a very big town to come up with those, those answers. And after you select your options and implement them, evaluate them. How well did they work? Is there something different we could do? Um, how, do, how, do we, how do we do something better? So it's a circular process that is not, is not short-lived. Um, you have to continually evaluate and readjust. So in the process, you have to identify all the constituents. Where are people coming from? Or, you know, what, what kind of information can they bring to the table and value everyone's opinion. Um, bring in foresters. Yes, deer are, are decimating our forest. They're, they're eating the seedlings and there's no regeneration in our forest. The conservations are concerned about, yes, the deer are eating the forest, but now there's no place for songbirds to, to have cover from their predators. You have property owners. The deer are eating my landscapes. The deer are eating my, my nursery trees that I spent hundreds of dollars on, and so on and so forth. So bringing in the whole community is very important so that everyone's um, addressed in the process. So in, in some questions, um, I'm just going to tell you, people ask me all the time, well, why doesn't the DEC? So one of the main questions we get, well, why doesn't DEC extend the firearm season? Um, and a lot of what we do is, is what we're allowed to do by law, right? So um, our representatives produce legislation and whether they're put forth or not, you know, that, that kind of garners what we can do. So the firearm season is only in the month of January because the law says it. And uh, if people would like that changed, they need to talk to your representatives uh, to maybe make that change. Often people ask us, well, why can't we bait during rec recreational hunting and make it more, um, more, make it easier. So again, that's also something that's in state statute that we can change at the DEC. And here's another one. The, why can't we use crossbows? It'd be a great tool, especially for older hunters that can't necessarily draw a bow anymore. We get so many more folks out in the woods being uh, proponents or being positive managers for the deer population. Again, this is in state statute, so if this is something that you would like to see changed, you need to talk to your representatives so that we can change law and potentially include crossbows in our seasons. So, in a take-home message, uh, this is a fragmented society, fragmented habitat. We have farms, we have woodlands, we have uh, properties of all sorts of ownership, and no, there isn't a one-size-fits-all strategy. Going forward, the objectives need to be realistic, and you need to be adaptive. There is no, there is no silver bullet. This will not go away, and it needs to be managed, and you have to keep on working on those impacts. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the actual uh, program for our DEC. Uh, when you're actually um, filling out your comment cards, I do request that you try to write them very legibly. 
those and your questions because I'll be reading them and I don't want to butcher anybody's questions. I'm going to hand it over to Councilwoman Cartwright as well. Thank you. So the blue card is for comments. The yellow card is where you're going to be writing out your questions. And um, I'm going to just repeat again the ground rules. Please, we are going to give you a time limit. Stay within your time limit for your comments. And then afterwards, we will have an opportunity to put forth the questions before the DEC. We do have a town representative here that can answer some town questions if you have that as well. So Jennifer Martin, who's my legislative aide, will be back here calling out your name and let you know what order you'll be going in. And I, I believe there are some hands behind you too, Bill, that would like cards over there. Okay. So um, again, we know that there are differing opinions in this room. Please. Just be respectful of each other. I know there's been, there have been meetings on this issue and there's been screaming and you know it, it just hasn't turned out well. I don't want that to happen here. You're doing yourself a disservice if we are not respectful to each other because I as an elected official cannot take the information to my colleagues to see if there is something that we can potentially do. If at all, that is what comes out of this session. Okay, so I'm gonna go take a seat over there and Jennifer will call off the names. I, yeah, I can call the names. <laughs> I apologize if I uh, do not pronounce anybody's name correctly. My name is Aphrodite Montalvo, so I completely understand names being mispronounced. <laughs> he wants to speak after. Oh, after. So I'm going to be uh, calling by the, uh, the order that we received them. The first up would be John German. My name's John German. I'm a lifelong resident of a Brookhaven hamlet. I live right next to Wertheim's uh, preserve. I've been hunting these deer since they uh, first became available. I, I got out of the Army in, Jan in 68, January 69. I believe they opened up the first season here. I've been hunting them ever since, including today. I know a lot of people don't like hunting, but I enjoy it. And we have a large amount of deer there. One thing the DEC I don't think did bring up, but I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you need to remove 40% of a population of deer just to maintain the population the way it is. You don't remove 40%, it's gonna stay the same. You gotta remove more than that to reduce it. I grew up in a Brookhaven town that uh, people lived on the North Shore and the South Shore and nobody in between. Now there's a lot of people live in between. They used to be farms where the deer lived. There wasn't, there's more deer now than there ever was. I would like to see, I think Brookhaven Town is a part of the problem because every time the Brookhaven Town requires large tracts of property, the town, the first thing they do is put up signs saying no hunting. Now I have plenty of places to hunt, but it certainly limits a lot of places. They have small plots of land here and there with houses all around them, and deer have a sanctuary and they move out to the houses to eat. I would also like to see for my own benefit since I hate to admit it, but I am a senior citizen and get a senior license, you have to be 70 to get that. If we could use crossbows, I would like it, but if we can't, we can't. That's in state legislature. But aside from that, I'd just like to make a comment that uh, I'm in favor of removing the deer, and I'd like to be the guy that does it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up is Bill Dentrone. Oh, he's fine. <laughs> Matthew Corcoran. My name is Matthew Corcoran. Uh, I'm also a hunter. Um, and just like John said, uh, I think here in the town of Brookhaven that uh, access is a, a real problem. Uh, you guys have plenty of lands that uh, could be hunted, but every time you go to access one, you find a sign saying no hunting. And, uh, you know, you can't get rid of the deer and get the problem to go away without taking taking care of the problem. So uh, if my public comment could be anything, it would be uh, more access to uh, town land. And uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Kathy Schiavone.
And following Kathy will be Elaine Moss, just so you're aware. It came to my attention recently that the uh, USDA uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services Wildlife Division was not uh, aware of the forum this evening. And uh, my contact there expressed frustration and not being asked to participate. Is there a reason why? Oh, currently we're doing comments at the moment. Um, we can note that your question and following the comment section, uh, we can work on that question. Thank you. Thank you. And Elaine Moss is next, and that'll be followed by Stephen Goldstein. Hi. Uh, so I wear two hats. I'm a resident of the town of Brookhaven since uh, 1974, 75. And, um, I'm also a member of the board of uh, Four Harbors Audubon, so some of my comments reflect that. Um, are we timed, by the way? I'm just a little confused here. Oh, I... Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> to myself, okay. So I'm gonna skip around a little bit um, and um, apologize in advance for the, um, for the um, hesitations at times. I just wanna make something clear. There's a misconception that deer are a main vector, are the, the main vector of deer ticks, they are not. There are numerous animals, uh, small rodents, uh, the chipmunks, the squirrels, the mice, um, other larger animals, flying animals, birds, reptiles, all carry deer ticks as a misnomer and it associates the deer with Lyme disease. So just to make that clear, uh, there are met many methods and uh, I, I sit on two task force, forces already for the town and I'd be happy to sit on a task force and be a stakeholder in this topic. Um, okay, uh, there's a serious concern about deforestation with deer. They're foraging the understory. They're removing the saplings. Uh, you see your neighbors, if you live in the woods, you see your neighbors that you never saw before 20 years ago. Um, that's all real. Uh, we're concerned about the birds returning, not having food stuff, um, not having berries through the winter to get through, uh, not, uh, insects not having homes and uh, areas to make their homes and, beer, and birds to make their homes when they return. Um, so that's certainly in the case, but I am a little concerned here that we, um, I know you take a regional approach with things. You certainly have different seasons um, for different harvesting at different times of the year um, in different parts of the state. And I, I almost think based on some of the comments that you made about farms um, and large tracts of lands and some of the comments well taken about parks. Uh, where I live, there is one park, um, a few acres north of me, um, but we're house after house after house after house after house, and I did not hear how it would be addressed in those kind of communities, and it has me concerned. So I'm gonna share a story. 12, I lived for 12 years next to a farm of 17 acres, not far from where I live now, a few miles south. And um, I had toddlers at the time. <laughs> you go chasing three toddlers in three different directions, and it can wear you out. And we had to limit during season when we were outside. We cringed during season because the farmer behind us, unbeknownst to us, had allowed people hunting. We thought he was the one hunting for the woodchucks that would come on our property, and were not told otherwise. But I was to find out years later that he allowed the area to be open to friends of his and other people he knew that would want to hunt on the property. And we were basically contained within our premises during that time. We were, at that time, I believe it was 200 feet, because I made phone calls to DEC, I made phone calls to Suffolk Police, and I was told there was really nothing that could be done, that the area wasn't posted. And so the hunting went on, and we left um, a few years later. Um, that hunting started approximately, I would say, 1980, and we left about eight years later. Um, but um, that was a real concern, and as a, a resident in a populated area, I want to know how you're going to address this. Now, some people here who are hunters said that if you limit the areas of the um, um, 
contain parks, then the deer will then turn out and go into the suburbs. But I'm a little concerned that we haven't made good note about the different areas within our town and within Suffolk County. We have much more heavily, heavy populated areas, 480 something residents in the town of Brookhaven alone. How will we address hunting next to our homes? I have many more points. I can put them as questions. Um, I'm a little, um, um, I wonder why here, at P, when you talked about PZP, um, that was done, um, that is being done in Hastings on the Hudson. They're using PCP. They have a 75%, um, sorry, 90%, I mean, an incredibly high reduction of deer in just thought. five years. Um, and I do think maybe you could readdress your, um, presentation that you give to the public to include the studies in Hastings because they've had great success with that program. That was thank, a thank sterilization you. of females. Sterilization of males but, has occurred you. on our, Staten our Island. Can you have talk about the sterilization please. of males on Staten Island. That was not as an effective, but this is something um, that I'm we sorry, really your time is up. I realize that. Thank, thank you. you. Next up is Stephen Goldstein and Joe Dorigo is after him. Hi. That was very good, by the way. I'd be willing to give you a minute of my time and let you... Uh, um, I, we've been out here 46 years in the Stony Brook Setauket area. My kids grew up. Um, they're older now. They're in their 40s. They grew up at a time when they could run around and no one had to be concerned about what they were going to bring home or what they'd step in and droppings in the yard. Uh, we have sometimes as many as seven, I live in East Satake, as many as seven deer in the backyard sometimes. And, and while it's beautiful to look at, and when my grandchildren spend the summer with me, they get a big kick out of it. But they're really captured into the house, and we really don't let them run too far along on the, on the lawn. Uh, they're, you know, blacktop kids at this point because we don't want them to step in something or get involved with the ticks or any of the other things that happen. There's another side point, which I come across recently with some friends. You know, the, m most of us live in half acre and below, so we're not talking about large parcels and we're all on top of each other. Um, if a deer dies on your property and you can't drag it to the curb, which depending on when you find it is how disgusting that is, um, the town won't k pick it up they won't come onto the property to take this large animal and you have to pay to dispose of it privately. And I've had people I know who have paid several hundreds of dollars to have somebody come onto their property to take away a dead deer. So I think that's a problem and that's probably something that could be rectified relatively easily. But in terms of trying to plan for all of Brookhaven, which is larger than Nassau County, you know, I think looking at it, certainly from the councilwoman's standpoint as a district, and try to do something within the district, especially in our area where there are some towns that actually have mayors and things, so they, are, they get to act somewhat independently. That's something that could probably be coordinated more easily, but um, you know, at this point I've lost the privacy to my neighbors because all my bushes that they weren't supposed to eat, that, which is why I planted them, are all like eaten up to about here. And then you just kind of look through, the tops are good, the bottoms are gone. So it's a real problem and something that's really relatively recent in all the 46 years I've lived out here. Thank you. Joe Dorigo, followed by Robert Ward. Good evening. My, uh, my property's been ravaged, like uh, probably a lot of folks here tonight. and. Uh, a few years ago, I was nearly killed on the road by five deer running right in front of my car. Um, I called the town, and I spoke to a town councilwoman. It was very sympathetic, et cetera, but bottom line, she, I think, as I recall, what she said to me was it was a state issue, nothing, nothing a town could do, um, which was frustrating, but that's where it was left. And then uh, tonight, if I understood the presentation correctly, I thought I was hearing pretty much that uh, there is nothing that can be done short, uh, long term that's effective other than culling or s drastically reducing the animal population 
in the area. Contraceptive, uh, contraception doesn't work, et cetera. Um, and then if, I, if this gentleman is correct, who spoke before, that it, that means getting rid of 40% of the population, that sounds like a huge undertaking and a huge number. And if it's true that the state is the only entity that can help here, then I'm wondering about whether the town has a, some kind of role there to play in terms of interfacing with the state or mobilizing opinion or helping legal action to form, that kind of thing. Now, I don't know if, I, if my assumptions are, are correct, if I'm, I'm being fair to, to everybody, but uh, that's, where, that's where I'm thinking right now. Thank you. So Robert Ward, followed by Tom Goolbranson. Good evening. <clears throat> I've lived in Lake Panamoka 35 years, since 1985, almost 40. Um, the last two or three years, we've had nothing but a problem there. Uh, I got cameras. I can show you video and video and video. I've had everything ate off my property pretty much. Uh, I've put fencing up uh, the front. I can't. Uh, there's all rules and regulations through the town, so that's not going to happen. At one point, we were actually putting out like watermelon and carrots and leftover stuff to keep them away from our plants that we're losing. I mean, every night, if it's not every night, we can, we can film it to you. It's every other night they have their spots where they go around. Um, I'm talking about losing money. Uh, the taxes go up, your property goes down. I'm a hunter myself. I've been hunting for 50 years. I got my first gun when I was six years old. Um, I believe in some hunting. I don't believe in just cruelty. But something has to be done. Um, there's a lot of property, like these gentlemen said, we can't go on. There's always a problem with somebody here. They, you know, the DEC's up your ass on it. Excuse me, but, you know, there's always a problem. They search it. It's, it's a problem, even with your bow. But um, it's just, it seems like it's a turn off more than a turn on because it, it can't be where it's out of control. Um, my uncle, I remember years ago when I was a kid, and you, you probably don't laugh me off the stage, but I remember in North and South Carolina, it was so bad there that they, they actually had dogs, not big old dogs. Everybody hunts with dogs, I don't care. They still want to hear with dogs, the bird, goose, geese, the, you know, duck, whatever. But they used to push them off the property like they do the, the geese on the golf course and everything. It may help out with the animal shelters too, if you get guys with the GPS and, and learn how to just to push them away because they don't care, they're gonna come on. Um, that would be something that the DEC's right gonna laugh all the way to the bank on and say no way, but it's something there that would keep them away from people's properties because they're out of control. Uh, with the deer strikes and the ticks, yeah, we had that problem a few times, but it's just coming on and eating your property away. And um, it's out, you know, there's so many regulations and everything, and I think, I'm an old guy now too. You know, I was in the Air Force, I hunted all my life, and um, the crossbow's good. It puts a good shot on, and you're not chasing them around. Uh, I've seen deer where you gotta go the next day, find them, this, that, and everything else. The crossbow, you know, it, it, everything's gonna be regulated, but I think there could be more done within and start thinking out of the box to the in the box, like the old time. Let's get outside the box a little bit and start thinking of some more stuff. We don't want to be cruel, but I think there could be a better way of doing this. Um, Cause there's a big argument and I'm getting beat up myself. Um, also, um, Kellogg State Park in Smithtown, I'm retired from there. That's a lot of good area to hunt. Uh, I don't see any hunting in there on both sides of the road there. That should be open up too, because there's a lot of deer strikes there. And speaking of deer strikes, is there a crew that comes around and picks the deer up? Uh, if you call, I mean, and say, hey, listen, I have a deer strike, or instead of a cop coming up and, you know, putting it out, of the, the, is there somebody you can call and actually, because I had heard a thing a while back that there was a, a you know, a town was like uh, putting it out to a uh, bid, but that would be a good thing, maybe with a basin truck to pick them up and put them away and, you know, 
the right way instead of leaving them on the side road where everybody's got to look at them. And that would be my end of my night. And thank you. Thank you. And Tom Clarenson, followed by Richard Green. Good evening, Brother. Thanks for having us meet. Thank you, President, for presenting this. So, yeah. uh, I'm going to speak as a resident, as a talk at 22 years. But like full disclosure, I'm the chairperson of the Council of Environmental Quality in Suffolk County, where we have a very control program, which has recently begun to include a section on um, tick borne uh, countermeasures or risk mitigations. But as speaking as a resident, just to share, uh, I don't own a gun, don't own a bow. Um, I used to be on the Environmental Conservation Commission of this little village, and it's kind of against the idea of uh, wiping the out population. Then I started to realize, yeah, it's got to get measured back to some level. But we can never find a number like how many deer should get out of that. It turns out there is a number, uh, the density of 17, and I don't know what the units were. But Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Game have a number in mind. So now we're going to try to use that to say, oh, are we getting there or not? Um, I'd like to ask a question, but I won't, so I'll make a comment. It's, okay. it's right. meant to be a question. So my comment is, I think the DEC should provide a little more detail, but it was good to see 3,400 hits. That's a, that's a number. It would be great to see that at a scale that we could deal with in the neighborhood level. Because if my village is taken a lot, but nothing has happened next door, we know that the population is filling and actually bounce up higher. When you cull down, population bounces higher, which is ridiculous, but it's unfortunately the case. So if we knew that this village was doing a pretty good job and the call permits turned into 15 that were taken or 42 that were taken. If we could see that number, it would give us some hope. Because last summer I hit three um, positives at medical hits. It turns out one of them was false, but I ended up coming out with two diseases and it took five months to get out of it. And now I am still not going over, but I'm looking to recruit bow and bow women and hunters onto our property because it's time to drop the population. But we want to do it in a manner that's a little bit mindful of some um, of the rest of the day. This is, so I would hope that DC could describe to us what numbers we could see at a village level, at a town level, at a regional level, instead of just talking county Thank you. Thank you. And Richard Rudin, followed by Richard Hi, I've been a resident uh, here in Brookhaven for about 40 years. Uh, I've sat through a few <coughs> presentations by experts from BNL uh, regarding the deer issue. The CDC right now has uh, identified about six different tick-borne diseases, and it's evolving and maybe more. Uh, I've had limes three times, so I've got a dog in this hunt, so to speak. Um, Conservationists say that the old growth trees, if we wiped out all the deer tomorrow, old growth trees are done for the next generation. What you see is all that there will be. Uh, we're all affected by the aesthetics, uh, our yards <coughs> being decimated. Uh, someone mentioned that all kinds of rodents, uh, birds and squirrels and so forth carry ticks. I'm sure that's true. But an entomologist from BNL said that the deer account for 80%. Even if we wiped out the deer, there's no guarantee you're not going to get sick. But it certainly improves your chances. We need to get things back in balance. It doesn't mean we all have to be wiped out. Um, the deer issue is going to take a long time to resolve. Uh, in the meantime, perhaps the town could look at modifying some of the fence codes to reflect the issue that we're, that we're dealing with. Uh, I think the fence code now is basically four feet in front and somewhat higher in the back, but it's not enough to keep deer off the property and keep you uh, safer health-wise. Just as the town requires uh, permits for a shed and a deck and whatever, they can require a permit for a fence. It has to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you have to demonstrate that it's going to be maintained. Uh, you, you know, you're going to soften it up with landscaping and so forth. And so. I think we'll all agree that it's a little frustrating in how you're going to deal with it with hunting. I personally feel that there should be hunting allowed on all private property, and it's like mowing the grass. It's 
not, you know, large coals cost a lot of money. Uh, Brookhaven has done that a couple times, it cost a fortune. The, the vaccination and all that is prohibitively expensive. But there are plenty of hunters, many here in this room, and, and others that I know personally, that are more than happy to come to your property, uh, and very discreet. It's a win-win-win. They take the meat, you take the meat, the rest goes to Long Island Cares, and it costs nothing. Thank you. Next speaker is Irv Strobel. Oh, good evening. My name is Irv Strobel. I'm a farmland owner in Center Riches. Our farmland and farm farming operation has been there for, at this point, over 100 years. I remember growing up in the uh, late 60s through the 70s, never, ever having seen one deer. The first deer we saw on our farm was probably about 1990 or so. Uh, a lot of other people have spoke, spoken about the reasons for that. Um, all I know is what I see, and, and certainly in the last almost 30 years or so, it's been an ex exponential growth uh, in the deer population, and, and certainly in the Bridges area, as, as well as the rest of the town for that matter. Uh, I'm having now to invest in putting in over well, over 6,000 linear feet of deer fencing around our farm at seven or eight dollars a foot. That adds up pretty quickly. Otherwise, there's no way I can continue farming. But it's always a real economic issue for me. Um, as far as some other issues, uh, as I said, never saw a deer on the farm until 1990. Never diseases until the 90s. I understand, I certainly respect the case the, the fact that there are a number of vectors uh, besides deer in terms of ticks and whatnot, but certainly there is a positive correlation between the increase in deer and, uh, and disease, the incidence of human disease. And I think it's getting to a point where we're now approaching a real human health crisis, and I think that has to be weighed in the equation as well. So uh, one final thing I'll note is in terms of the town, uh, I would urge the town to do a very careful inventory of town-owned lands, uh, figure out which of those lands and properties could be hunted on, and open them up to, to hunting. Um, we've got a number of acres of town farm, excuse me, town-owned land next to our farmland. Um, you know, once I put up the fencing, I'm sure that town-owned land will be full of deer. So that's only going to push it to the neighbors. That's too bad, but I have to watch out for my my own operation. So I appreciate the opportunity to share those thoughts this evening. Thank you. And our last speaker is Suffolk County Legislator Al Krumsky. Good evening. Uh, Valerie, thank you for hosting this. It's very important. And I want to thank everyone from the DC uh, tonight. I think you did a very good job here. Um, as a landowner and uh, elected official, I've worked with you for many years on this issue. Uh, it's really important you hear that and I came tonight because I represent part of Brookhaven and it's it's um, it's a complicated issue but um, you're taking the step in the right direction and and looking forward to working with you on uh, on future solutions you heard about the access the limited access here in Brookhaven that can be solved uh, you hear about the you know the uh, the need to use crossbows by parts of our you know members of our population that also could be solved so uh, you know, thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Uh, so if there are nobody else who wishes to comment, uh, we can move on to the question and answer section. We have, as a reminder, for questions and answers, uh, my colleague Bill Fonda uh, in the center, he's holding around these papers. Uh, you can just please write legis uh, legibly any questions that you might have. Uh, and we can bring them up. I believe some of these questions are for the town. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to be addressed tonight, but it is good for them to have those questions uh, for future reference. Um, so first question is to please address any methods of birth control that have been successful in the past. So um, like I said, there there is not a lot of successful use of birth control. Yes, in fenced-in areas where they're doing research on fenced-in deer, but out on the open landscape where deer have to be captured, sedated, 
treated and released, there is not much data to support this. Yes, there has been a project in Hastings on Hudson. Again, it's a research project, so after three years, the researchers pick up and go. So now the researchers are here in head of the harbor. The first go round of the treatment, we know at least one of those deer have moved from head of the harbor to hop hog outside of the study area. Deer don't stay in one spot, they move. So that accounts for immigration and emigration. So when you have treated deer, you get more. You get ones that leave that are treated. So yes, there can be some success with surgical sterilization. However, again, that's very cost prohibitive and um, the projects that we have had, people have walked away from. A lot of people like to point to Fire Island saying that they were successful. After 10 years of trying to sterilize deer there, they still have a deer problem on Fire Island. So, um. Okay, thank you. And to um, address measures you tend to use within heavily populated suburban districts, not just where they are, there are fields and farms, mostly in eastern Suffolk. Um, I'm not sure if D this is a DEC question. I think this is something that uh, needs to be determined through municipalities, but if I can let anyone try to address it. Yes. So certainly in more populated areas, it is a challenge um, with different uh, permissions giving, being given on across the landscape. So it is beneficial to say a certain number of landowners, if their land is too small to allow hunting on their personal land, to band together to make a large enough parcel. So this has happened in uh, Nassau Point on the east, not, not in Brookhaven, but out in Southhold. Uh, and it, it happens here in Brookhaven where parcels that are adjoining, they, they either share hunters or they make the land big enough to make it work. So you have to be you know, um, willing to talk to your neighbors and try and come up with a, a solution for, for all of you. I apologize, I had to, this is a bit of a long question, it's three pages, but <laughs> I'll get through it. It was determined in 2017 by the legal departments of both the DEC and the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services that the use of rifles in deer hunting was illegal, this, um, despite their being used. A bill was put up to a vote in 2018 in the Assembly and Senate and was voted down. In November 2019, both the New York State Assembly and the New York State Senate passed a bill to amend that. Governor Cuomo vetoed it. One of the reasons that uh, the new bill made it oh, one reasons was that the new bill made it necessary to be a certified nuisance wildlife specialist. This new regulation would establish a minimum level of marksmanship, require applicants to have liability insurance, and make it necessary for them to issue reports. While that seems all well and good, it makes the process to obtain permits more difficult and therefore services to cause delay in managing the overabundance of deer, resulting in the exacerbation of the growing negative effects. What is the DEC's thought on this? Thank you. <laughs> My thought on a bill being passed to allow certified wildlife specialists, what is, what do you, what's the question? I guess it's just asking for a comment. I'm not sure if we are, can really comment on legislation. Basically, DEC, uh, our role is to implement legislation that is passed by the New York State. And the, uh, by New York State, if legislation is not passed, it's not really something that DEC can really provide comment on. Um, it's really for us to uh, have that uh, actually passed bills and, and to implement those bills. That's really what Gen DEC's role is. Um, there's a couple more questions. Um, I don't think that these are questions that uh, the state can address, um, but I can put them out. I don't know if there's anybody in the town or uh, that can address them, but I'll put them out there. Um, 
There's one that, does the town of uh, Brookhaven have a system approach or a plan to reduce the deer population in Mount Sinai, in particular north of North Country Road? So I'm going to ask John Turner, who's our consultant for DEP, to come up okay. and um, comment. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, to answer that question is we have not played much of a role uh, with regard to deer management. Uh, we're superseded by the state. Our, our role, real, role has really been providing some opportunities for hunting um, pro on properties, larger properties that the town has that we've either acquired individually or in partnership with other levels of government. There are a few, uh, for example, the large property on the west side of Smith Road in Ridge that uh, we bought in cooperation with the county. We, there is hunting allowed there. There's hunting allowed throughout the Manaville and kind of Riverhead Hills portion of the eastern part of the town of Brookhaven. But most of the acquisitions the town makes uh, involve relatively small parcels of property, often embedded in suburbia and that really aren't conducive or suitable uh, for hunting opportunities. As it relates to speci specifically for Mount Sinai, We've not done anything with regard to trying to, to control the populations of deer there. Just like, quite frankly, we have, haven't had a role, nor do we have a responsibility or direct involvement in trying to manage uh, deer herds. That's the, the province, of course, of the, of the state. So um, that's really where things stand. I think this is another one for... Uh the town codes for fencing were not written when deer were a problem. Codes can be amended. Shouldn't deer fencing be allowed around homes to protect families as well as farms? We think that makes a lot of sense, right? And I, and I stand to be corrected, Herb, you may know the answer to this. I think we amended the town code years ago to make it easier for uh, farmers to have deer fencing put in. Is that in the code? Okay. Well, certainly, I know the Agricultural Committee talked about it years ago. I thought it was, that it was done to actually kind of expedite the ability to put in. Uh, that's something we should take a look at. And, and, and same thing with regard to some other uh, person that spoke with regard to a residential settings to allow fences to go as high as, as six feet. I'm, uh, I'm sure that the uh, council would be interested in taking a look at that to try to help out homeowners to reduce damage from you know, deer browse on their properties. And is there a contact person who can speak with village regulators to ensure local ordinances support the hunting flexibility improvements described tonight? Yes, is that a... <laughs> uh, I think they're asking if uh, somebody in the municipality and maybe perhaps with the state can speak with the villages um, and to help, I guess, organize um, a response together in order to help to implement these types of changes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it may be someone within uh, the Division of Land Management uh, that would be, we're certainly responsible for managing collectively the lands that are acquired uh, in, in the town. Uh, so it, it, would, it would be myself and my other colleagues, the staff in the, in the Division of Land Management, which is within the uh, Department of Law. And I can give contact information, both email address as well as phone number if you like. To, Yes, I'll do it before you leave. I could do it now. But, uh, oh, okay. Uh, then my number at the, the town is 451-6417, and email address is jturner, lowercase, at brookhavenny.gov. You can also reach out to two other individuals in land management. That would be Luke Ormond, O-R-M-A-N-D, and John Lessler, L-E-S-S-L-E-R. I don't know their numbers because we all share a cubicle and I just turn around to look at them. I never call them on the phone, uh, but their email address is the same thing. It would be just jlessler at brookhavenny.gov and lormond uh, at brookhavenny.gov. And again, we'd be happy to discuss this issue in greater detail with you. Uh, another question is, uh, do you have an estimate of the deer population in Suffolk County or DEC Region 1? And just for everybody's edification, DEC Region 1 consists of both Nassau and Suffolk County. So in general, we would say we have some extrapolated idea. Um, however, those take some huge leaps. 
we don't manage to a number of deer, we manage to the impacts. Because there isn't a magic number that says once we reach this level, the problems are gonna go away. So if you're keeping data of car strikes, tick-borne illness, damage to your property, and those things are going down, then you're headed in the right direction. So when those impacts start getting to a more desired level, then we would say the population is managed. So there's the methods that are used in, in determining deer population are flawed. Uh, there's been municipalities that have done uh, expensive flare flyovers uh, to get a deer population number. That number was exceeded in the recreational hunting season that year, so we know that it was wrong. Um, so they're really, it's really a bit of a waste of time to be counting the deer when we know that they're causing problems and we know we need to be reducing them. I think there were a couple of questions uh, during the comments as well. I'll try to uh, address some of those. Somebody did ask if there was a crew around or somebody to pick up uh, deer strikes or dead deer on their properties. Um, and there's none of that from the state level. Uh, I don't know if anybody in town wants to address. Yes, if it's a town roadway, we, it, highway department would come and actually pick up the deer from the roadway. But if it's on your private property, as was indicated previously, then we will not take the deer off of your private property. But I, I did understand the concern that was raised by the constituent a moment ago, and that's one of the things I'm just going to talk to the law department about um, amongst the number of other things that came up. Um, there was another person who was asking about uh, having some more detailed, I guess, asking about uh, deer per acre, not just in a regional aspect, more in more concentrated areas, such as like how many deer should be available in a, a rural, in a, su a suburban, if we can do something of that nature. Uh, I don't know if we can really address that at this time. Again, we're not really saying a number of deer is, is good for a certain habitat type. Um, certainly deer can be more, uh, there's more cover for deer in woodlands, but there's not enough food for deer in woodlands. So it's really a mixed, mixed landscape and it really, yeah, I really can't answer that question. <laughs> oh, how many were taken? Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I misunderstood, um, sorry. So the, the harvest is, is recorded every year, so, so it's down to town level, not, not municipality level, so um, village or such. It's at, at the town level. Yeah, Brookhaven, it's been roughly around mid-70s, 800 for the last five years during the recreational season. Okay. Um, I think there was one other question about uh, if other agencies would be participating tonight. Uh, we were invited uh, by Councilwoman Cartwright to help and to uh, pr make this presentation tonight. Um, uh, in the future, I guess, as the community management plan, if, we, if uh, there's a decision to bring in further um, uh, agencies uh, that could assist. I think that decision will be made in the future, but uh, we're following the community action plan tonight, and tonight was just kind of a gauge to determine how the community feels and to uh, provide some education um, for the community and uh, gain comments. Um, I do not see any further questions. Um, if anybody has any further could questions. Can I ask a question? Could, oh, sure. And, and that is, do you, uh, can you point to other examples where this community process has gone through and what have been the results that we could look to for so, guidance? So, yeah, certainly we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, South Hold and Shelter Island have been working at this problem for a very long time, uh, East Hampton in some, some cases. So what, what they've done or doing are somewhat different depending on their constituents. Um, certainly both Shelter Island and South Hold have refrigerator units that, that their towns provide and this helps uh, hunters that have already harvested and they don't really have room or need for more deer. It helps other constituents in their area to be able to pick up a donated deer. And then if those deer are not picked up by local residents, then they bring it into food donation. So it is a huge benefit to those constituents um, to have a refrigerated truck. Um, some of the communities, um, they try and bolster some, some interest by their constituent hunters um, by having lotteries for more, more equipment. Um, so every time they harvest a deer, they get more entries into the lottery. So 
you know, yeah, maybe they're, they're done for the season, but um, they might win something out of it. So what are some, so, some sort of incentives? Um, East Hampton, they, they publish, they have a very robust data set of where the car strikes are. So they have a map on their website of all the hotspots of the car deer collisions. And in the last few years, they've put up signs that show the number of deer that have been, been hit at those intersections. So it's very staggering to see at, at this one corner, 473 deer have been hit. Um, so certainly they have a big transient population, a lot of people that don't, don't live there long term or there for the summer. So it, it is helpful for people who are visiting the area to see that this is, this is a hot spot for deer strike. So, yeah, everyone's working at something, and what's, you know, you can take a little bit here and there. Um, just changing codes to allow, to allow more deer removal. That's, that's a big step. All right. Um, oh, is there further, are there some further questions? Uh, asking you to, sorry? Uh, oh, we're just asking to have them written down. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah, so for Suffolk County, we've been roughly around 3,200, 3,400 in the last five years, and that's like, I, sh I showed that one graph where we were climbing, we we're below, below like around 2,800, but in the last five years, we've been still been climbing. That's recreational harvest. Our um, nuisance removal is about a third to a quarter of that, and about 1,000 uh, to 1,200 for Suffolk County. I don't, I didn't bring the Brookhaven specific data. There's, there's less nuisance permits in Brookhaven than there are in the other towns, but it is contributory. Well, that, we, don't, we don't keep that data. Um, no, they don't. State Farm publishes something on, you know, for statewide data, and it, I believe it's like somewhere up of 70,000 car strikes across the state per year. Uh, there's another question. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Uh, yes, sir, in the front. I'd just like to know, you know what, what the next step of the town's going to make. Is there any kind of agreement to have your you know, town council or, or whatever? And is there going to be more meetings here? Are we going to make a panel of you know, residents? Uh, I'd just like to see what the next steps are going to be. Okay. Yes, so that was one of the questions. I was actually going to save it for when I'm wrapping up, but I will address it. So. As, we, as was stated by John Turner a moment ago, how we functioned in the past has been, we defer to the DEC, the, you know, the state has jurisdiction over wildlife, so basically we have not played a very active role with respect to deer management. But as an elected official, it has come to my attention over and over again, and when I reached out to the DEC, they said, well, the town can do something. You can start off by following our management plan, have a meeting, see if it's something that the community wants to do. Like, does the community want to take some form of action? Do they believe that this is an issue that needs to be addressed? I believe it's an issue that needs to be addressed. 
how it needs to be addressed is not something that I can determine on my own. I'm one of seven elected officials here in the town of Brookhaven, and when you look at all of our different six council districts, we're all very distinct in our own way. Uh, so I have to talk to my colleagues to see how is it that they'd like to proceed. But when you look at the management plan, it speaks to after creating um, an opportunity to educate the community and getting a survey of the community residents, the next step is to determine whether we want to take some form of action. I've listened to all of the stakeholders here today, and it sounds to me that there's some low-hanging fruit, some things that the town can talk about immediately without forming a committee and moving forward and saying, do we want to do this because it can help potentially solve the problem or increase the quality of life of our Brookhaven residents? So I'm going to do that immediately. But I have to talk to my colleagues to see if they would be willing to support me in possibly creating a committee and now start to look at what the other municipalities are doing and what's working um, with the other municipalities. I've never believed in reinventing the wheel. If other people are doing something and it's working, then we should be talking about how we could possibly duplicate that. But we, of course, have to look at how the town of Brookhaven is distinctive from those other locations. So I wanted to have this first opportunity to hear from my community and find out what is it that you all wanted. And I think that we've gotten a nice picture um, from varying stakeholders as to what could potentially be done. So that's where we are. You will hear more from me after I bring it to my colleagues. Um, none of them were able to make it here this evening, but we have, that's one of the reasons why we taped the, the, this forum. And I'm also going to request that this forum be placed on channel 18 so that people who are not able to make it have an opportunity to be educated on what's happening in their communities with respect to the deer. And if we do that, we can also follow up and ask people to write in letters. Let us know what their experiences have been. And, and take all that information and talk to my colleagues and see what are the next steps. Because I cannot do it alone, given in, in a town this large, with so many different council districts with different issues. Thank you. And are there any other questions? Oh, gentleman in the front. Nature wars. 
It's in elementary school. Just that simple. Oh, thank you. Uh, any further questions? All right, uh, okay. that's it. Okay. Yeah, so I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come here um, and thank you to the DEC for leading this conversation. I will be bringing this back to my colleagues. Um, the last point was well taken, you know, and, and, and that was what I understood from day one. How do you deal with an issue like this in a town such as this, um, which has such diversity. Um, so I am going to talk to my colleagues and will definitely report back to the community um, the same way that we reported this way, you know, with either through a press release um, or um, having an additional forum if we are going to be moving forward. I, I, my recommendation is that this needs to continue to be studied and that there will be a committee formed to deal with all of the different areas in the town of Brookhaven. Um, but I have not yet brought that to my colleagues and we'll be doing so in the next few days. So thank you for taking your time uh, out tonight to come here and if you have any additional questions I will be here and I believe some of the DEC members and John Turner will be here to answer any additional questions. Have a great night.